Hey, it's Aaron, the Metal Theologian. So we're going to look at 10 unique records today. But um, first of all, I do a little shout out for uh, Corey's channel. One of the channels has been out there even longer than mine. Um, I think it's just called Corey's channel now. It was Just Add Vinyl for a while. I should say Just Add Vinyl for the hell of it and uh, whatever else. Anyway, he, he had a, started a thing a while back called Sealed to Revealed. And, kind of, and it kind of degenerated into like people going, oh, here's this Metallica record. I just bought it. You know, Walmart, let me crack it open. It's sealed or revealed. But, like, the idea originally was, like, if you had something that was, like, old and you're just going to bust it open for the first time. So, um, anyway, I was watching the Heavy Metallurgy stream on Friday night. And uh, for some fucking reason, they always put some corny-ass bands in there, right? But um, they start talking about Bonfire. And I was like, you know some man? I fucking, I have that copy of that first Bonfire record, I think. And I don't remember what I thought of it. So maybe I should just pull it out just for the hell of it. So I went over and pulled it out, right? And I realized the thing was actually still sealed. <laughs> so I guess I didn't know what this sounded like. So we're going to do a real seal to reveal because this is a legit, uh, this is from 1986. You see that shit? Uh, this is still in the original shrink wrap, but we are going to crack it open and check it out together. It's probably going to suck. <laughs> actually, I'm, I, here's what I'm expecting. I'm expecting this record to be about two thirds suck and one third cool. You know, which is really kind of ridiculous because to me that cons tends to constitute about a six out of ten, which I guess doesn't add up at all based on the math, but kind of adds up based on uh, the amount of enjoyment I get. So fuck it, that's just how it is. It's funny, there's a saw cut on it right there, and when I was pulling it open, the shrink wrap kind of caught there. Like it was weird. It's never happened to me before, and I've opened a lot of records. Look at that. This thing that's been folded since 1986, man. Look at that shit. Look at that crease. Here, listen. It's the sound of the 80s, man. All right, so we're going to fire this up. <laughs> that's RCA. That's also not really a good sign, is it? But, uh, but we'll see. You know. There are a lot of good records on RCA, too. Just I can't think of it, a lot of good metal records. There, I can think of a couple, though. You know, It's not zero. Just not exactly... Uh, Noise International, you know. So, so a quick shout out to Jurgen too. I pulled this out after watching his videos. So I've been listening to a lot of Jurgen for too. But today we're going to do something else. So uh, I sort of got called out by Vinyl Richie, Vinyl Richie, who um, was entering. Uh, I think it was a contest. I'm not sure because honestly, it was started by a channel that I'm not familiar with at all. I kind of feel like an asshole for not shouting him out a little bit more. I'll try to remember to put his channel link below, but. I, I really don't know his channel, so I I don't know if it's good or not. I don't know. I, it does seem like he's been doing something, like, online for a while, like a magazine or something like that. And, like, the YouTube is a newer aspect of that, like something new he's branching out into. So more power to him for that. I mean, that's kind of what Marty Worm's doing. He already had the label and shit, and the channel kind of became an extension of that. It's working out, so. Anyway... The original challenge was to show 10 records that nobody else in the vinyl community has. And, um, I mean, there are a few different ways to go with this. And there were all sorts of rules and shit, but I'm not really bothering with that because I, I don't even want to enter the contest because I don't feel right. I just think it's a cool topic, and especially since Vinyl Richie called me out specifically to uh, do one of these. Uh, I figured I should probably do this. So this is just what I could come up with today, by the way. And um, I have five 45s and five... Um, 12-inch records. They're all LPs, I think. No, there are a couple EPs in there. And it's a little bit weighted towards metal because, like, I've kind of been collecting metal seriously the longest. You know what I mean? Like... It's been probably 25 years since I started looking at my metal stuff as, like, something sort of, like, that's, like, the, li the main library of the collection. You know what I mean? Like, when I sort of really got back into it in a big way after sort of not being into it when I was in college and shit like that, or not as into it. <coughs> so, um, it's been about 20 years, maybe, 20, 25 years since I got to a point where I was like, I'm tired of missing out on the good shit, so I'm just going to kind of grab everything that looks kind of like it might be metal and see if it's good or not. If it sucks, figure out what to do with it later, you know? This isn't that bad. It's a little flashy. Showing off the production button a little bit. 
I also have a new e-cigarette. I'll fucking misplace it. I don't know where I put it. Oh, there it is. Yeah, this isn't terrible. We'll see how it goes. You know, it's funny. This isn't terrible, but in 1986, I would have hated this. I would have thought this was poser shit. Blah. Yeah, so anyway, I didn't want to just go and like pull out like what that, that's probably the most rare shit. First of all, because I always show rare shit. And second of all, because... You know, it's it's not cool. It's about the money. That's just bullshit. You know. So, what I've kind of gone for is records. There are a couple in here that are just I don't think I've ever seen anyone else show up, and like someone ought to fucking show them. But um, some of these just have like specific stories or like my personal stories and shit like that with them. And um, it's kind of uh, skewed in favor of Cleveland here actually too, because. Uh, there's a lot of shit that I got before I left Cleveland, or like when I've gone back since, like when I sort of got hip to the whole like 70s Cleveland punk scenes. I have some like offshoots from that and shit. And, well, well, we'll see in a minute. I just want to make sure you get a little bit of a taste of this. Because I know there's no way I'm going to make it through 10 records that I'm thinking no one else has seen before. <clears throat> without wanting to put them on. You know, that's just kind of how I roll. I'm going to be like, oh, you got to hear this one. I'll start with the 12 inch records first. And no, I guess I'll start with the 45s first. So, first of all, this is kind of, I've shown this, I've, done, I've shown a lot of these before, but uh, this, this is sort of the cool ones I thought of today. So, this is the first Tim Huey 45 on Clone Records out of Akron. And Tin Huey, they made one LP that was kind of anemic and isn't that hard to find, but unfortunately kind of sucks. I almost think they'd be better off if that record weren't out there. Because the first 245s are really good, just like weirdo, like kind of psycho punk shit, like um, like early Devo or something like that. Maybe not quite as bonkers as Devo and a little bit more sort of prog in spirit, but definitely as far as like the recording budget and shit, it still totally has the punk aesthetic, you know? I mean, they're dressing up like that, right? So what makes this special? Because I'm pretty sure other people have shown this. Well, I happen to buy this at a shop in Cleveland. Let me take a step back. So I'm sure if you're watching my video, you're probably a Perubu fan. And you probably know that the uh, singer for Perubu was um, a guy named David Thomas. And in the early days of Perubu, and prior to Perubu, when he was uh, with Rocket from the Tombs, he was a stage named Crocus Behemoth. Okay, well this is my copy of the first Tin Huey 45. And look who seems to have had it before me. Is that focusing? So I'm generally inclined to be skeptical of this sort of thing, right? But first of all, I don't know why anyone else would write Crocus on their fucking record. And second of all, I mean, I, I, the guy, the the guy who ran the road, the record shop, it was a uh, Platterpuss Records in Cleveland. It hasn't been there in probably 20 years, but if anyone remembers Platterpuss, that was a fun record shop, man. I love that place. And if John's watching, man, shout out. I'm still, I'm still hyping your fucking records 30 years later. All right, so um, yeah. Anyway, so I asked him about it. He was like, oh, he was kind of coy. He was like, well, where do you think I get my shit, man? I read my friends' record collections, you know. So take that for what it's worth, but. It would appear that I have Crocus Behemoth's copy of the first Tin Huey 45. Now, just as Cleveland, actually going to Cleveland, I suppose, from Akron, strictly speaking, but Northern Ohio, if, you, uh, if you're about my age and you grew up in that part of the country, you were too young to have watched Goularty, but uh, you were probably the right age to watch the Big Chuck and Little John show, which I actually went on for my 11th birthday party. Um... And you're probably all old enough to watch The Ghoul, which is sort of like a later guy sort of doing the Goularty shtick, but in his own way a little bit. So I watched The Ghoul, and there was a song on there that, um, I don't know, I almost thought that it couldn't have possibly existed, but then like I found it somehow on YouTube later, and uh, let's cut to the chase. The song is I Lost My Kobasi by Dave Stacy, or by the Dave Stacy Orchestra. And um, I'm going to put this on for a minute. This really is kind of a turd, but I'm probably going to play it a few times before I put it away. So that's my review of the bonfire, man. <laughs> yeah, you know something? 
I think this is every bit as good as a decent docking record so far. And hey, you know, what the hell. All right, we're going to go to Cleveland here and uh, check out Dave Stacy. There are going to be about two or three people who watch this who give a shit. But those two or three people are going to be freaking out once this fucking starts playing. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, another one was uh, Who Stole the Kishka by the Maddie's Brothers. But that was relatively big. I'm pretty sure this was just like a local private press. Probably wasn't more than like a 500 run. It's like a little novelty song. Because who the fuck is Dave Stacy, right? You gotta love it, right? I'll bet no one else in the vinyl community has this fucking record, though. I'll bet there aren't more than a couple people who would even want it. And those people probably play it about as often as I do, which is... I think I was making a video last time I played it. Alright. I just realized I have three more 45s here, and two of them are Cleveland, so... Let me show the one that's not Cleveland, okay? I'm sure some of you know the band Lucifer which was some English band that claimed to have uh, like recorded their album in a cave in Arizona though that's like all bass and it kind of sucks but it's like a great like cult like weirdo hard rock record from the early 70s but for some reason they made a couple 45s which I didn't know until I happened upon this in a record shop in San Francisco and I gotta love that writing on there too you know Prince John's promotions right there but yeah, this is a Mr. Jack 45 by Lucifer from 1973. And I don't know exactly what they mean by All About the Ripper, but maybe if I played this record more recently, I would, you know? You know, it's it's cool because of what it is, and it's cool because of, like, the story and sort of the image they built, but the record isn't really all that, you know? Like, it's fun for about 10 minutes, but then you're kind of done with it. It's one of those, so... Alright, so check this out. Next I'm going to show is by The Mice, another Cleveland band. And they actually had this shit reissued not too, too long ago, but um, I was actually friends with two of the three mice uh, when I was at Cleveland State. Um, I was friends with uh, the drummer and the um, the principal guy, um, like the guitar player and singer Bill Fox, and the drummer's Tommy Fox. I was probably tighter with Tommy, but I was definitely friends with both of them, you know? Um... Well, I didn't know anything about this or anything, actually. Tommy was in a different band at the time, and Bill was doing some other musical shit, right? Let me actually just show this real quick, because I'm going to put this on for a second, too. This is just, like, cool power pop shit, but uh, this is it on Mouse Tunes. I actually got this 45 because uh, one time I was at work, and, like, someone uh, at the record store at the time, and someone came in. I don't know. They had found some of these in the basement or something like that. He just, like, one of the guys I was working with was, like, passed him out. They were like, here, take this home and listen to it. And I was like, okay. That guy's name was Doug, actually. He lives in Austin today, I believe. And a uh, shout out to Doug, formerly of the Record Exchange in uh, Lakewood, a long time ago. So uh, anyway, yeah, that put me onto the mice. And they also made an EP called For Almost Ever and an LP called Scooter. And it's all brilliant. It's all fantastic shit. I'm struggling with my little fucking adapter here. But um, this 45 is, uh, I've never seen another copy of this since that first day when that guy had three of them in his hand. There's something so like pure about it, but it's still really energetic and really honest, you know? I almost feel like when people talk about bands like the Shags and shit, like this is what they're imagining. You know what I mean? Then you listen to the Shags and it's like, I mean, it's cool and the story is great, but it actually, it still sucks. You know what I mean? But this kind of emanates of that, but still has the weird factor, but still like the hooks and shit. It's like the full package and the innocence, you know? All right, so uh, the last of the Cleveland 45, I can't believe almost 15 minutes in already, but the LPs will be faster, believe it or not. Um, so around that time, there was a guy who was sort of known around Cleveland who uh, was known as Soupy T. 
who made a 45 as Superstar Dan the Man. And as far as I know, the only upload of this on YouTube is one just like really shitty one like through the air that I did a few years ago because I was telling someone about it and just wanted to give them a quick thing, but it came out with two different covers. And according to this, it wasn't particularly limited because it was the number of infinity, right? But um, yeah, this guy was, uh, I, I mean, I don't really know what his deal was, right? All I know is the hearsay, but the story was like, you know, he hadn't been the same. He came back from Vietnam and it was never quite the same and like... He uh, does his jams and like he didn't because because they're always songs. I mean they're always jams. They're not songs. But um, he doesn't give a shit if he has a band or not. <laughs> so um, this record consists of two acapella jams. There aren't a lot of times where I'll say you've never heard anything like this. I actually won't say that now either. But I will say that I've never heard anything else like this. So uh, prepare to have your mind blown. Oh yeah, they were all like this too, on that weird clear vinyl with the splotches in it. That wasn't as common uh, in the early 90s, which is when I would have bought this. I remember feeling like a, like a dumbass because I was like, buying two different copies for the two different covers. But now I'm really glad I did. record you'll see all right so this one this next one this one I just don't I don't think I've ever seen anyone show this and it's a fucking great record and I just feel like hyping it right now you can put away your Pink Floyd records because what you really want to hear is gah <laughs> With this fantastic record called Auf der Bahn zum Uranus. I'm a lot more careful with my German pronunciation since you're going to start watching my shit. Anyway, these guys, they sing in German, which is unusual. Awesome psychedelic shit. Like, talk about fucking space rock. It just, like, sounds like it's, like, being beamed down by aliens. If you like that first Gila record, this is like that. The Gila might be a little bit better as far as, like, its overall composition, like, as an LP... But this record is just as much fun, man. I've been a big fan of this record since I first heard of this. I had this on CD in the 90s. Then I replaced, I upgraded it to vinyl uh, probably around 2000-ish. And it's still an absolute favorite, man. If you don't know this record, I'll bet some of the prog guys, like Nico Malcolm probably knows this record and shit. But if you like that kind of shit and you don't know this record, man, you need to, uh, you need to do yourself a favor. Now, I warned you about the metal. <laughs> this fucking rules, doesn't it? They'll never hear a fucking better record than this. So, I'm a big fan of Raven, bitch. I think this shit needs a reissue so bad because it's hard to find. That's expensive. I feel guilty every time I hype it because of that, but this is just one of the greatest fucking records ever. <coughs> I actually managed to track down a copy from the singer, of all places. Um, I don't remember how I'm getting in touch with him. It wasn't like I went and sought him out. People did that, but uh, back around that time, I hadn't done that this time, but somehow I ended up in touch with him. And he was like, yeah, I do have a copy of it you can have for this much, but the cover's a little bit chewed up. And I figured, you know, they're just like some bends or something, you know, like... You know, like that. It'd be a little chewed up like that or something. I figured it was idiomatic. But uh, when the record arrived, no. It's actually like chewed up by a mouse or something like that. But this copy is unique. <laughs> On the one hand, it kind of pisses me off, like as a collector. You know? Because I want to have a perfect copy and shit. But on the other hand, no one has a copy quite like this, you know? Similar story with this one, actually. Maybe a little bit more personal. I was even on the fence about whether I should even show this one. But this is another one. It's a very rare record. Very sought after. Fucking great. And, uh... 
I'm actually going to put it on for a second after this. But this is the Street Child record. And I, I love this record. It's great. I'm going to put it on right now. You get the idea about CPT. I told you I wasn't going to fucking be able to do this without playing half the shit. So, um... Yeah, just sort of through chance, I ended up in touch with... God, it's funny how many of these involve bands. Just sort of through, through chance, I ended up in touch with... um one of the guys who had been in the band, and I just sort of, you know, did the fanboy thing a little bit, and kind of went, oh, shit. Fuck, I lost the image sticker for this thing. Um, well, there it is. And uh, he was like, oh, that's cool, man. So he just, like, sent me a copy of the record. And the thing is, it wasn't like <clears throat> it was, he didn't know or anything like that, you know what I mean? Like, he knew that people, there were, like, people who were after this record, but he was like, no, man, just fucking have it. And he didn't even know this, but I was in a pretty rough place, man. It was like it was like a little sort of glimmer of light when I needed one in my life. You know what I mean? You go all the times like that. If you're older than like fucking ten, you know what I'm talking about. So I think the story is pretty relatable that way. So uh, every time I pull out this record, I think of a guy who did something really cool for me sometime when I really needed it, just because he wanted to do something cool, you know. So shout out to Jesse Odom for this. And um, God, I love this fucking record so much. Here we go. Street Child. Actually, let me show that fucking label because it looks so nice and private. Right? Putting on straight with the Temple of Set. This record actually has a drum machine. And it's so good it doesn't fucking take away from it at all, you know? Like, if you're a drum machine hater and you can't listen to Street Child because of it, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> it's total labor of love, this record. But that's why I like this private press shit so much, because people do it because they care about it, you know? There it is. Here's the back cover art. Alright. Getting down to the end here, which is good because the video is getting a little bit long, but um, it's another one I've talked about before. I don't know how legendary it actually is, but uh, some of you probably heard me talk before about, um, well, the day I walked into a thrift store in LA and found this for a quarter. Not at all a unique record. I've already shown records that are way more rare than this one, to tell you the truth, as far as how many are out there. But somehow, someone knew what this was enough to peel about a third of it, but it still ended up at the thrift store. I don't know. I don't know when they peeled it, but the glue's too old to peel now anyway, you know, so it's probably going to stay like this forever. It's my copy, though. It's unique. And uh, I know I'm probably not the only person in the vinyl community who has one, but I'll bet you a lot of money that I am the only person in the vinyl community who got one for a quarter. All right. And this is the last one. This is sort of a throwback to, like, the real early Metal Theologian days. This is all sort of a stroll down memory lane anyway, but... Uh, one of my very early videos, I kind of blew people's minds a little by showing this record. So, this record actually kind of sucks. It's like sort of a just Japanese beat record, but the band is called Pig, with a Y. And it looks promising, doesn't it? For a Japanese record. If this were a British record, I wouldn't touch it. But as a Japanese record, it looks promising. Look at that, look how thick that cover is. Well, that's because it came with a special thing where you can push the nose and the little mechanism inside slipped, so it's down here, but... <laughs> this is the pig record, the one with the squeaky nose. <laughs> the one that the metal theologian busts out once a year, so... And no one else has ever shown this, as far as I know. So there you go. Ten records that nobody else in the vinyl community has or has shown. And a, bit, a couple of these I'll bet people do, but you know. I went for it. I went for the unique ones too. I had other ones with like shit written on them and that that I thought about, but I didn't want to make it just like personalized ones, so kind of went for a little bit of a balance here and uh, hopefully you got a couple laughs out of it. So is this fucking good? What an awesome riff that is, man. And he sings in a low tessitura for a metal singer. He sings like a baritone. He gives it like a little southern rock thing almost. Even though they're from New York. 
I think it's just his range, though. I don't think it's actually anything about the style particularly. So, anyway, fucking love it, man. And you should, too. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching the most diverse channel in the vinyl community. The second most, I mean. <laughs>